Here's the pitch. A line drive to center. This could be it. Mays waiting. He's got it. The Giants win the pennant. The Giants have won it. The Giants are going crazy down there. was fun the 87 giants on august 10th 1987 san francisco beat houston in a game that symbolized the giants rags the richest saga and brought them to the brink of first place there they stayed for the rest of the season what better way to tell the story of the 1987 giants than to retell the story of that game Live from Candlestick Park, it's the Houston Astros and the San Francisco Giants. Good evening, everyone. I'm Joe Morgan, along with Dwayne Kuyper. And tonight we have the first of a four-game series between the Houston Astros and the Giants fresh off of a four-game sweep of the Cincinnati Reds. What do you think about that, Dwayne? Well, for Giants fans and for the players in the organization, it couldn't have been a better weekend. They're only now one game back. The Giants are hot. The Astros are not. We'll be right back with the start of tonight's ball game right after these messages. But first things first, like a visit to the sunny climes of Scottsdale, Arizona, for a personal giant spring. I'll take it from here. What do you think about sophomore Jay? I don't even want to talk about it. First baseman, number 22, Jack Clark. Oh, whoa, 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 Will Clark. Oh, yeah, that's right. Oh. I'm sorry. <laughs> Talking with the newest giant, Eddie Miller. And, Eddie, I think the question that's on the minds of most Giants fans as well as fans throughout the oh. diamond head. Well, uh, Bob, my head is shaped like a diamond. Well, oh, Bob, you know, it's, it's pretty tough right now being in Arizona. You know, and uh, i like every restaurant I walk in. Jeff, uh, I understand that you're the first computer-enhanced relief pitcher in the history of the game. That's why they call you Max Headroom. You guys. So do the Giants. So back to the game against Houston and on to inning number one. Here's Joe Morgan. Count remains three balls, two strikes. One third. Base hit. And the Astros take a one to nothing lead. You remember, Joe, on Friday night. The game started out similar to what's happening tonight. Lacoste got a big double play, and consequently, that particular double play really helped in the, the first victory against them. Exactly what the Giants are looking for here. It grounded in the hole. Nice play by Spire over to Thompson. Back to first, and that'll do it. There's the double play you wanted, Dwayne. All season, the Giants provided slick and dependable defense, sparked by Robbie Thompson. And Jose Uribe, they led the majors in double play. One can have a dream, baby. Two can make that dream so real. I don't think there's a better double play combination in our league. Two can make that wish come true, yeah. I think Jose Uribe is best shortstop in baseball. It takes two, baby. It takes two, baby. Me and you. But we give a lot of credit to the pitchers. Uh, our staff has been outstanding in getting the ground balls. If they don't get the ground balls for us, we're not going to turn them. The short stop could be. There's one on the first they do it. It takes two, baby. Make a dream come true. Just And they're like two little kids playing together all the time. While San Francisco's infield may add up to the perfect equation, the sum total after one inning in this game against compute favorably for the down more.
Fly ball in the right field. Candy Malinata goes back. His head. Rounding third coming in to score is Glenn Davis. And Caminetti goes in the And the Astros take a two to nothing lead. Not an unfamiliar predicament for the Giants who struggled early in the season when they lost several key players to the ranks of the disabled. In fact, injuries came so early and often, the Giants ended up using 122 different lineups. Chris Brown suffered a broken jaw in May. The same week that shortstop Jose Arribe took to the sidelines for one of three visits. Add to that a disabled Robbie Thompson, and three quarters of the starting infield was out of commission. That is something the Giants can ill afford to lose A, an infielder, and B, Jose Uribe. There was about a three-month period that our starting infield only had played six games together. All of which left the coaching staff in need of fresh troops. So enter Matt Williams, one of several AAA recruits who got an urgent call to San Francisco. Williams makes a nice play, the long throw, and he got him. No one got the Giants out of more predicaments than veteran Chris Spire, who filled any and all vacancies. He's done such a great job. You know, when you play positions like shortstop and second base and third base, <laughs> crucial positions as well as he plays them, it's unbelievable. Spire was truly for hire everywhere. But if his glove was hard to believe, his powers of inspiration were hard to ignore, the combination of which earned him the Willie Mack Award. Very seldom do I uh, ever stand up and hold a team meeting. I try to do uh, most of my leadership by example. In helping lead the Giants at the plate, Spires showed unexpected power with 11 home runs, including a five-day stretch in May when he hit a pair of grand slams. Power is what the Giants could use right now against the Astros. We're back to the game, and San Francisco would like nothing more than to see the resting hackman get back to action. Jeffrey Leonard is still on the pine. Though Leonard was bothered by injuries in the second half of the season, he figured heavily in the Giants' success with 19 home runs and 63 RBIs. There was no denying that Hackman was a true blue hum baby. No, I like to go out there and play as hard as I can, as long as I can. And if that's being a, um, a hum baby, then I'm one. In sparking San Francisco to a 16-7 April record, Leonard hit a smashing 354. Smooth and steady all season, he never went more than two consecutive starts without getting a hit. He's our heart and soul. He's our MVP right now. He's, he's playing excellent baseball both um, at bat and in the field. And, and besides that, he's our team leader off the field. And, uh, you know, if there's a home baby, it's Jeffrey Leonard. An all-star for the first time in his career, Leonard enjoyed his best season in three years, proving the fitting compliment to cleanup hitter and slugging sidekick, Candy Maldonado. I was fortunate that uh, I was sitting behind him and I could see a lot of things that he does. And when he does something good, you don't want to be left out. It's like, uh, he did it, I don't want to let him go. Have no fear of that. After winning the right field job with a terrific 1986 season, Maldonado hit a career-high 20 home runs this year. He also became only the fourth San Francisco Giant to hit for the cycle. Candy drills it into the alley in right center. Leonard is around second. He will hit for third. He is being waved home. Candy hits for the cycle, drives in Leonard. With 85 RBIs in all, Maldonado showed a knack for getting the big hit. As if to say more hot stuff on the way, Chili Davis collected a career-high 24 home runs while the Giants set a San Francisco team record with 205. A dandy switch hitter, Chili also set a National League record in this September game against the Padres when he cracked home runs from both sides of the plate for the third time in his career. As for cracking the comeback code in this game against Houston, the Giants don't want to make any more concessions. But in the top of the fourth inning, the Astros are about to strike once, and then once more. Here's the 2-2 pitch. Caminiti gets into this one. Aldretti is going back. He's looking up, and this is gone, a home run. And this puts the Astros up in this ballgame, four to nothing. Hmm, for Roger Craig and company, a grim reminder of May and June when San Francisco encountered the worst of times.
The Giants play below 500 and enter July the picture of despair. Bad as the news was, the Giants would turn the tide in July and post the best record in the West. Question is, could they turn it now against Houston's four-run lead in the fourth? There's Roger Craig, the hum baby. I don't think we can say enough about the job that Roger has done. And I'm not talking about just as a manager. I'm talking more as a psychologist. A psych. He, yeah, he's done an exceptionally fine job because when the Giants came back from the Houston road trip, the last trip, I was a little <laughs> well, down. Yeah, he made it sound like, well, we got him right where we wanted. Exactly. Now. And I think the, and the players believe that, and they kept fighting, and you see where they are now. By August 10th, the Giants were about to get a lasting taste of first place. If Hum Baby was Craig's motto, patience and optimism were the sum and substance. I think I'm the luckiest manager in baseball. The attitude has just been unbelievable. They can't wait to come to the ballpark. It's fun playing for somebody like a Roger Craig because he takes the attack against everybody else. Roger gets the best out of us. Uh, he has the right type of attitude. He has the right type of positive thinking. He's definitely an outstanding manager. He's a good player's manager. Their feeling is that let's stay close, fellas, in the seventh, eighth, and ninth, and then Roger will figure something to do to win. Well, it's the fifth inning now, and the Giants are counting on their master tactician, who will go on to be named Associated Press Manager of the Year. As we go to the giant half of the fifth inning, Joel Youngblood's going to pinch hit for Dave Dravecki. There's a base hit in the center field by Joel Youngblood, so he gives the Giants a start here in the fifth. Chris Byers, the hitter, he's playing in place of Kevin Mitchell. There's a little looper in the short right field. A diving attempt, not in time. He can't come up with it. Joe Youngblood went all the way to third. And Mike Aldretti will be the hitter. Smashed in the left field for right field for a base hit. Chugging around the third base will be Chris Byers. And it's a four to one ball game. I don't think you can say enough about the Giants bench in the 1987 season. And to be sure, the Giants had a deep supporting cast. Besides Youngblood, there was Harry Spillman, Stanford's Mike Aldretti, Eddie Milner, and Bob Melvin. As for Melvin, he was a huge asset, throwing out 40% of all attempted base stealers. As if to say, at your service, Eddie Milner brought a dashing combination of speed and defense, plus a slick stick down the stretch. Harry Spillman was a prince in the pinch. Witness this clutch home run at Candlestick. Long home run, I'd say. Upper deck, upper deck. While Spillman proved to be a trusty temp, Veteran Joel Youngblood was equally reliable, tying Spillman with 13 pinch hits, most on the team and fourth best in the league. No member of the Giants supporting cast showed more far-reaching talent than Mike Aldretti, who sparkled at every position he played. My role is still the same. I'm, I'm contributing to the ball club, doing what I can, and doing what I can when I'm asked. Ask and you shall receive, declared Aldretti, who obliged the Giants by filling in at four positions and hitting a most impressive 325. With such a deep cast, the Giants were understandably confident when trailing Houston in the sixth. After all, behind every successful team, there's a great bench, and the Giants were no exception. Sometimes that spot in the dugout can be awful lonely. 
but with the sweep of the Reds this weekend I'm sure that Roger Craig does not have that lonely feeling. Nothing like a pair of critical sweeps against the league's division leaders to lift a team spirit and nothing like improving one's identity by putting a halt to the raging St. Louis Cardinals who were the Giants first victims. There goes Coleman and he's out. Well, Brindley's one of the best in the business at throwing out runners. The Cardinals may be one of the best in the running business, but in this late July series, the Giants' defense closed up shop. Besides turning eight double plays in the first two games, San Francisco managed to keep Vince Coleman grounded. The Giants took the first two games, and then in the 10th inning of Game 3, Will Clark took to the seats. That one's hit a long one! In game four, Vince Coleman tried to rally the Cardinals, but again, it was no go. There is a throw out. Coleman is picked off, and he has had himself a tough series here. That was only the start of the inning. Hit on the ground, double play. Can they turn it? They do. And this half inning has characterized the way this series has gone here in Giant Land. A four-game sweep of St. Louis. Then much ado at Candlestick two weeks later when the West Division leading Cincinnati Reds came to town. In the series opener, Mike Lacoste threw a five-hit complete game victory, ending the Giants' four-game losing streak and bringing them within four games of first place. For Pete Rose and the slumping Reds, more surprises the next day when a reactivated Candy Maldonado rediscovered his stroke on the very first swing. And a rocket to left field, and that kicks by Tracy Jones. Around third is Kevin Mitchell, Leonard to third, Maldonado to second, two nothing Giants. The Giants went on to make it two straight against the Reds, and then in the first game of a doubleheader, Will Clark cracked his sixth home run against Cincinnati. It was also Clark's fourth home run in four days. As for the oncoming Giants, a sweep of the Reds, one game out of first, and about to pull far away from the matting crowd of the West. As for pulling off a small miracle against Houston, it was simply a matter of patience and opportunity. Glenn Davis. Davis is two for two with a single and a double, and he hits one down the line. Spire knocks down, long throw, got him. Getting the Giants into contention has been the sole occupation of President and General Manager Al Rosen. His efforts in bringing about the team's rapid resurgence earned him UPI and Sporting News Executive of the Year. As to Rosen's tried and true formula, it's simply a matter of trading and more trading, all of which he does with a simple philosophy in mind. Uh, the other general manager feels like he got what he wanted, we feel like we got what we wanted. What the Giants got was pitching. Dave Dravecki and Padre teammate Craig Lefferts arrived in early July. The same trade brought infielder Kevin Mitchell, who promptly offered his long ball services. Mitchell joined the Giants at Wrigley Field, where he doused the Cubs with a shower of power. Fly ball, deep left center field. That ball is way back, and Kevin Mitchell has homered in his first at-bat as a Giant. He has hit another two-run home run. Al Rosen, you're a genius. A modest appraisal, it seems, for in snatching up Kevin Mitchell, the Giants filled a big void at third base and got a bat that produced heartily since Mitchell's arrival in early July. In trading for Dave Dravecki, San Francisco immediately bolstered its pitching staff. If Giants pitching had been inconsistent before his arrival, Dravecki's six wins in his first eight decisions helped bring fresh respect. Our job is basically to keep our ball club in the game, hopefully through the seventh inning, and then allow the reliever to come in and slam the door shut. That means bringing on Craig Lefferts. Acquired in the same trade that brought Dravecki, Lefferts helped the Giants maintain command down the stretch. Don Robinson had no trouble commanding last rights on the opposition. Also a choice pickup, Robinson collected 19 saves. He's strong, he can pitch, he can start, he can go in the middle, he can pitch late, and most of all, he's got a terrific bat. I don't know whether you realize that he's some kind of hitter. 
Rosen made some kind of deal in August when he plucked Rick Russell from the Pirates. Besides being a serious contender for the Cy Young Award, Russell won the league's Gold Glove Award, dispelling any notions that he may have lost his stuff. Every game I start, I go out there with the idea that if this is my last game, I want it to be a good one. And Russell with a shutout and a two-hitter closes out the game with his 12th complete game effort of the year. With the Giants reaping immediate benefits, there was no doubt that the best laid plans of Al Rosen had the team on the right course. He wants to win. He's doing everything that he can to help, and I think that definitely has to give the players a little added push. You know, I can't say enough for the trades that Al Rosen made because uh, he made them at the right time for a pennant contending team. There's looks at one of these players, and for them to pull it off, it's got to be the coup of the year. I always say the most valuable player on this club is Al Rosen. Rosen prefers to give that honor to Giants owner and chief architect Bob Lurie. Bob Lurie should get uh, even more credit than Roger Craig and myself. At no time does he ever question the reasons. Uh, he has just wanted us to bring him a winner. The Giants would love to bring San Francisco a winner in this game against Houston. It's the top of the seventh. They're trailing the Astros 4-1. to one. And Scott Gereltz is on in relief. Here's the 2-2. Two and two. Darwin swings and misses. So he strikes out. Standard fare for Sky Gerelds, who led all National League relievers with 127 strikeouts. On a staff that featured that not-so-standard pitch, Gerelds provided a traditional touch as the Giants' hard-throwing right-handed stopper who held opponents to a 192 batting average. Also sparking the Giants to the best ERA in the league was Mike Lacoste. Splitting time between the rotation and the bullpen, Lacoste collected a team-best 13 wins. A smash back to Lacoste and a double play. After twice undergoing arm surgery, the first time in 1984, Adley Hamaker enjoyed a hearty comeback season in which he won 10 games. Kelly Downs lent his services both as starter and reliever. The result? 12 wins and reason to believe Giants pitching has a rosy future especially if Mike Kruko is proclaimed healthy once again and returns to 1986 form when he won 20 games. As for making a comeback in this game, time is running out on the Giants. And we got a pretty good crowd, Joe, and I think it certainly helped that the Giants swept Cincinnati over the weekend. Nice night here at Candlestick. As we see some of the candlestick enjoying themselves the spirit of Giants baseball produced almost two million fans and a club attendance record such were the joys in hum baby I think it's wonderful. Awesome. Awesome. Everybody is trying to win for the Giants this year, and they're doing it. They're winning. That's Hum Baby. Hum Baby. It's gonna be fun. Yes! If the Giants ever needed their Hum Baby brand of optimism, it was now in the bottom of the seventh. The Astros still lead 4-1. San Francisco's only run came in the fifth, and since then it's been more like ho-hum. So, hoping to put the Giants on the comeback trail, Eddie Milner leads off. And Milner drives one in the right field as it bears a foul. It's gone on a home run. One and two of the count to Candy Maldonado. Mike Aldretti is now at second base. Here's the one and two to Maldonado. He lines one in the left field on the third base line. Aldretti is going to score easy. Maldonado rounding first. 
He is heading in the second with a double. It's now a one-run ball game. And here comes the natural, Will Clark. There's no hitter San Francisco would rather have up in this situation. After all, when the Giants need instant runs, Will Clark is the natural choice. A bundle of talent, the 23-year-old first baseman lived up to top billing in only his third season of professional baseball. Besides a team leading 91 RBIs at a 308 average, Clark collected 35 home runs, most by a giant first baseman since Willie McCovey hit 39 in 1970. When it comes to Will Clark, one nickname is one too few. Well, here's the natural, Will the Thrill. Bob Brindley came up with the nickname Will the Thrill, and uh, it's pretty much stuck. Everybody just calls me Thrill now. That is amazing. He's had eight home runs in the last 12 games. You know, when them pressure situations come up, you definitely want the bat. Fastball grounded up the middle, base hit the center field, and the ball game is over. As long as I do something to help contribute to a team win, it's fine with me. Ground ball, a nice save by the first baseman. Holy cow. Will Clark saved the ball game. Boy, he's something, isn't he? Will Clark has been hot all day. You know, I want to be a perfectionist. I want to get a hit every at-bat, and if I don't, then I get a little mad at myself. Clark could hardly despair of his 1987 numbers, which proved that in San Francisco, when there's a will, there's a way. Though Clark failed to get a hit in the seventh inning against Houston, the Giants might still have found a way to beat the Astros. They've cut the deficit to one and are still batting in the seventh. Could a picture-perfect comeback be in the works? Stand by as the Giants have a chance to tie it up. The Giants have brought the excitement back to Candlestick here in the seventh inning. So here's Bob Brenly. Yeah. Hits a fair ball down the left field line. Maldonado scores. The game is tied, and Brenly's going into second with a double. How about that? A sudden reversal of fortune. But as Mr. Brenly and his sidekicks know all too well, keeping things balanced is ever so important in this game. Still, there's no denying that when a team is winning, players can get to feel loose, very loose. A few of the guys said, uh, we'll keep the ball club loose, even when we lose a tough game. Case in point, the one and only Captain Kangaroo. Bob Brindley. My specific title is just the secretary of the kangaroo court. Uh, a lot of the cases uh, are only funny if you word them in the right way. I slipped on the turf and the ground ball hit me in the mouth. And they said uh, I was trying to block the ball with my gold tooth, my bulletproof tooth. So much for fun and frivolity. Time now to summon the Calvary and untie the score against Houston. But first, it's the top of the eighth, and San Francisco must hold the Astros in check. And that'll bring up Billy Hatcher. Hatcher's two for three in the ball game. He smashes one off of Scotty Gorelts, and he may get a double out of it. He's going for two, and he'll make it, and that'll bring up second baseman Bill Dorn. He has one RBI in the ball game already along with one base hit. Scotty fires and there's a line drive to the left right center field. It's going to drop for a base hit. Hatcher's going to come in to score and the Astros are going to take a 5-4 to four lead here in the eighth inning. It ain't over till it's over, Joe. This season, truer words have never been spoken. San Francisco. Let the facts speak for themselves. Besides 34 come-from-behind wins, the Giants pulled out 20 victories in their final at-bat. So the Giants explode with three runs in the last half of the eighth inning. Caught at the fence. Unbelievable. Kelly Davis will score. 
What a comeback by the Giants. They've scored six runs in the last three innings. Jose Uribe wins it for the Giants in the bottom of the ninth. Certainly not over for the Giants, even though they have only three more outs. We're going to the bottom of the ninth, and the Giants need one to tie and two to win. And the Maldonado is leading it off. He'll be followed by Will Clark. Here's the payoff pitch. Fastball hammered deep. To Get out of here. Back to the fence. It is gone. strike to Will Clark. Fastball, and it's all over! It's all over! <laughs> Can you believe it, Dwayne? <laughs> Just another whole-hum day at Candlestick Park. Two comebacks, two bottom of the ninth home runs, and now nine straight wins at home. The Giants were surging all right, and by the middle of August had all but eliminated the last of their rivals. Little wonder pennant fever was boiling over in San Francisco. Ralph Barbieri here, backed up with callers on Sports Phone 68, and I gotta tell you, in all my years in the city, I've never seen a phenomenon like this. This has probably been the busiest day we've ever our, our sales are just phenomenal. It's, it's an unbelievable feeling. I've been uh, following the Giants forever and ever and ever. I can't wait to see the Giants do well, and I think it's great for, uh, great for the city of San Francisco and everybody between here and, and Monterey. By late August, San Francisco was all alone in first. There was no place Giants fans would rather be. I'm just thrilled. I'm happy. I couldn't be happier. We love them. They're going to go all the way. We've waited a long time for this. One. Needing one more win to clinch their first title in 16 years, the Giants headed to San Diego on September 28th, accompanied by legions of fans. In San Diego, it didn't take long for Giants fans to get a taste of that clinching sensation as San Francisco busted out with a record-tying two pinch-hit home runs, the first courtesy of Jeffrey Leonard. He swings it as a drive to deep left field, away back, kiss it, goodbye! An inning later, with the score tied, it was time for Chili Davis to use his clout. High in the air and struck well to right center. Tony Glenn going back. See you later. For both Leonard and Davis, career home runs number 100. And for the Giants, a chance to win it in the eighth when reliever Don Robinson came up. Kiss it goodbye. Home run for Don Robinson. Robinson's home run put the Giants ahead, and then his fastball took care of the rest. Slug on, fly ball to left field, back goes Leonard, he's at the track, he makes the catch, and the Giants have won the Western Division. And on the field go the Giants. This celebration was especially gratifying to Al Rosen and Bob Lurie, who engineered the Giants' rapid rise to championship status. If ever a team deserved to take a champagne bath, this ball club did. We're going to win it all. That's all. We're going to win it all. You know, we got the momentum going. we got a good, outstanding ball club, and uh, we're a team of destiny. Getting a hero's welcome, the Giants came home to celebrate in hum baby style. San Francisco fans couldn't wait to embrace the new champions of the National League West.
Next stop, St. Louis, Missouri. Time for the Giants to meet the East Division winning Cardinals and greet the national spotlight. Game one featured a host of Cardinal surprises, most of all Greg Matthews, a last minute replacement who was full of the unexpected at the plate. Besides driving in two runs, Matthews threw seven and a third innings of four hit ball. He then left the rest to Cardinal relievers, who sealed the 5-3 win and put St. Louis up one game to none. In game two, just in case anyone thought the Giants might have left their hearts in San Francisco, Will Clark proved otherwise. High, towering drive to right field. Back goes Akindo on the track. At the wall, gone. The spirit of St. Louis sank even further when Jeffrey Leonard came up. Another drive to center, McGee going back to the track at the wall, and it is gone. A three-run margin was more than enough for Dave Dravecki, who stymied the Cardinals. And facing only 30 batters all game, Dravecki two-hit St. Louis as the Giants evened the series at one win apiece and sent the Cardinals scrambling for more offense. For game three, there's no place the Giants would rather be, back at Candlestick and humming on the home turf. For starters, San Francisco scored four runs in the first three innings. And that's whacked into the left field corner. Will Clark contributed to the early windfall with an RBI single. Then for the third time in three games, St. Louis got hacked by Jeffrey Leonard. He's hit one to deep left center, and look out now, if it's gone, it is gone. The Giants had a seemingly comfortable 4-0 lead, but then Leonard took a nasty spill, and so did San Francisco. The balance suddenly shifted from the Giants to the Cardinals. St. Louis scored six runs in two innings and took the lead. Where everything had gone San Francisco's way early in the game, it was now all going to the Cardinals. And despite the absence of Cardinal stars, St. Louis held on to win 6-5 to five and go up two games to one. In game four, the Giants rebounded from their exasperating loss with equal parts pitching and defense. Mike Kruko supplied the pitching while his friends took care of the defense, which meant turning four double plays. Cardinal offense screeched to a halt after St. Louis scored two early runs. Then, en route to series' most valuable player, Jeffrey Leonard used clutch mechanics to make playoff history. And he hits a fastball in the air to left field. Bowman going back to the track, to the wall, leaps in the air, it's gone, home run. For Hackman, a record four home runs in four straight games. And for the Giants, still more clout from Bob Brenly, whose insurance home run left a 4-2 lead safe and sound in the hands of Mike Kruko. Round ball to Robbie Thompson, to Uribe, to Clark. That did it as the Giants tied the series two games to two. Still in San Francisco for game five, the picture took on a decidedly different look. Seems neither the Cardinals nor the Giants knew if they were coming or going. By the end of the third inning, the score changed four times. The last coming when Kevin Mitchell retied the score with the Giants' ninth home run of the series. Mitchell's blast made it 2-2, two two, but the Giants weren't through. Jose Arebe also figured big in San Francisco's offense, which added four more runs in the fourth. From then on, Joe Price, who started the season in the minors after arm surgery, figured out Cardinal hitting just right. In five innings of relief, Price allowed one hit, becoming yet another unlikely hero in San Francisco's comeback story. Ground ball to Robbie Thompson. There it is. Victory for the Giants, and one went away from the pennant. On to game six, and back to St. Louis. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, Good morning, Friendly greetings to the Giants were short-lived. Once they got to Bush Stadium, Cardinal fans flashed a different message. No matter how you spell it, 
the Giants were on enemy turf, and no matter how you look at it, they were in trouble. A botched play in the second put Tony Pena on third. Then moments later... Fly ball to right field and pretty shallow to the line. Maldonado makes the catch, and Pena is going to come. The ball of the play, and he is safe. From then on, starter Dave Dravecki restored order. He didn't allow a run for six innings while striking out eight. But John Tudor did him one better. He shut out San Francisco into the eighth inning and then gave way to his trusty bullpen, which put the finishing touches on the one nothing victory and brought the series to game seven. One last chance for both teams. In the finale, Cardinal pitching continued to squash San Francisco offense, holding the Giants scoreless for a record 22 innings. The hitting that had been so lively in the first five games fell silent, drowned out by the agonizing sound of Jose Oquendo's bat in the second inning. I drive into deep left field, back goes Leonard, gone! A three-run home run for Oquendo and a crushing blow for the Giants who were shut out six to nothing as St. Louis won its third pennant in seven years. For the Giants, great expectation turned to great frustration. But while they felt anguish in losing to the Cardinals, the pain was soothed when the Giants came home to a heartwarming welcome. Together, the team and the fans had survived their share of empty Octobers. And now, just two years after losing 100 games, the Giants had risen to the top of the National League West. Champions. Champions. They've inspired me all summer, all season long, and I'm, you know, we're just going to keep this thing going for next year. We're going to look at everything positive during the off season. We come come back in spring training, ready to roll in 1988. If the dream hasn't been realized yet, the Giants and their fans know it's in the making. These may not be the best of times in San Francisco, but they're about to be.